ridiculously delicious. Shit, can you hear me? Are you frozen? You're frozen. I'm frozen. It's a whole thing. Shit. Uh, There we are. Okay, you're back, sort of. Julia is frozen. There she is. All right. Yay. Um, No, I was just saying that the pad thai that I made yesterday was ridiculously delicious. Actually, once I brined the cheese, it was quite good, too. All right. We are live and have been live. Uh, So, hey, guys, I'm Bethany Quinn here with Quintersectional Conversations, and I am joined by Kyra Kendall and Julia Cohen, who are the co-founder or the uh, excuse me, the co-hosts of the podcast Casting the Net, where they discuss all kinds of movies. And I'm sure they can give you a much better description of it and get into the nuances of why their podcast is awesome but also you'll see their sparkling personalities and understand why they're pretty fantastic. While they're doing that, uh, I am going to be attempting to make yogurt um, and praying that my shitty internet holds up. So um, here we go. So uh, it was going to be cheese, but then I totally forgot and I made cheese yesterday. Um, And so we're going to be making yogurt today. (laughs) Sorry about that, guys. Cheese. What? <laughs> I have never I wanted to eat that type of cheese. As a concept came to be, it was like purely by accident. The podcast? No, cheese. Oh, cheese. Yeah. What? Wait, so you were excited about the cheese? A little bit. I, I'm so sorry. I'll have to. So I realized part of the problem is I don't have any more cheesecloth. So I will, I feel like I will have to uh, make some more cheese and then give you cheesecloth. And actually I want to do, I was thinking what would be really cool is um, to have Callie Holder on again. Cause she, she was on before talking about the science of bagels. So I feel like having Callie talk about the science of cheese, it's kind of a mind blowing process as I discovered. Oh yeah, Callie's um, terrific. She's amazing, yeah. But I have no idea how cheese is made, and I also feel like Wait, if she, Callie she knows is on about the science of cheese, the what? I feel yeah, like I feel like Callie explaining the science of cheese would be cool, and also she probably will be able to tell me how to like take my cheese game to the next level and like introduce all kinds of different like I don't know molds or whatever you do with cheese. So, um, mm-hmm. so that's but here it's we'll just make whenever we used to have like physical get-togethers i just remember bethany way back in the day i always had cheese count on to bring the cheese that is so accurate i was really excited that i was going to be on the cheese episode uh, and now i'm I, sorry I had to have the i'm so sorry about that yeah i um oh this is half a quart hmm Okay. We're gonna make it work, though. We're gonna make it work, though. It's gonna work. We'll 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 do cheese. We'll do yeah. cheese another time. I will get you guys cheese because yeah, you live in the DC area. Yeah. For those of but us I apologize for this. my confusion. That was my yeah. bad. I would gladly see you do maybe 15, 20 minutes on how to create a perfect cheese board for one. I could totally do that. Oh, for one. Oh, for one. Yes. Well, just, it's like restaurants do it, right? Where you like pay a stupid amount of money and then end up with like a little tiny, like enough to put in your eye cheese. Right? Except you don't have to pay a stupid amount. Of, well, you would be paying yeah. for each cheese. You just get many servings of each cheese for one person. Um, Mostly I've been trying to perfect my cocktails for one. Yeah. So what have you been doing? What kind of cocktails have you been making? Mostly, let's say, a lot of, I've been trying, it's more that there's been a few that I've been trying to perfect, like, Mm -hmm. my Negroni is pretty much where I want it to be, Okay. and what I I want to do in the summer is is make the best, not French 75, but the French 75 equivalent with uh, soda water, so whose name now eludes me, I believe it's Tom Collins. Okay. And just generally... Mm. You know, try to make the solo living experience one that includes a civilized cocktail hour. I love it. I love it. I think, yeah, we should totally make that a thing, actually. We could totally do, like, a happy hour edition of Quintersectional Conversations where we just make cocktails and, you know, get drunk and say funny things. Yes, yes. Um, I support well, that. Obviously, I wouldn't be participating because I don't drink anymore. And that's, you could that be the like mocktail hour. You could be the one to create all of the mocktails. Like, what, eight years sober now? Congratulations. 
Yes, yes. <laughs> it's been a while. Yeah. Yeah. That was one of those things that I never thought I would give up because, like, one of my friends used to say, uh, booze is delicious. Yes. And then it stopped being delicious. <laughs> like, there was a certain point where I had kind of given up alcohol for about a month so that I could focus on losing weight. And then when I went back to it, I just found certain vodkas to taste disgusting. Like, so interesting. Some of them that I used to really like started to taste like rubbing alcohol. Well, a lot of vodka tastes like things. rubbing alcohol. Which is not good. No. No, no. no. Like, that was the thing. It was just, okay, this feels like it should not, this tastes like it should not be ingested in any way, shape, or form. <laughs> how I was starting to feel it about certain uh, alcohols. And then I started to realize, oh, crap. I'm getting tipsy off of half a mixed drink. So, <laughs> well, that's not necessarily a bad thing. No, not at all. Not at all. No, not tasting bad, on the other hand, is a pretty good indication you want to stop. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, I've gotten yeah. now to the point where I'd rather have one drink of good stuff than two or three of bad stuff, and it's working out much better. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because I remember back in my twenties when I would start the evening with. Uh, Long Island iced tea. Oh, and that is not a happy even place when, to be. Even when I was still drinking years later, I just think to myself, what was I doing? Yeah. I, I mean, I feel like that's just like growing up and realizing like, what the fuck was yeah, I doing exactly. in my early 20s? Like, yeah, I didn't, I mean, I didn't know you until our late 20s, right. so I'll take your word for it, but wow. <laughs> It's like something to judge me on now. It's like, what was wrong? You know what? You grew up. I, I feel like if we I were all judged for our... I just feel bad for you. <laughs> no, that's, that's fine. I feel like if we were all judged for our drinking choices in our early 20s, um, you know, that would be a very, very alarming thing. You know? Anyway. Yeah, um, if you didn't do something you regretted in your 20s, then you did your 20s wrong. Basically. Accurate. Accurate. <laughs> So tell us, uh, tell us a little bit about the podcast. Coyote, you started it um, a while ago, right? Uh, yes. Um, yeah, it was me and um, another one of our mutual friends who we had worked on some uh, filmmaking projects together because for whatever reason, I just reached out to her to be like a PA for me. And it was funny because like the first short film we did, uh, she ended up being like PA for me as well as acting a role in the short film and also being a double for the main actress who I still, we still do film projects together with to this day. And um, we, I just decided, Hey, I want to do a podcast. And I had done podcasts before when I used to write for pop culture sites okay. and they never really took off. They usually last maybe like between six and 10 episodes mm -hmm. and then would stop being done for whatever reason. And I said, I want to commit to this. And I also had like a lot of audio visual equipment I could take advantage of working right. as a videographer and at a certain point, rather quickly, once we started, we started using the studio at my job to record the episodes in. And then we also took it another step further and tried to do video as well. And then I got let go from that job and that all went away. But we still <laughs> were able to record episodes and I had my own like, equipment that I could use. So that we were able to continue, but basically the whole premise of the podcast was to focus on movies that were only available on streaming platforms or released in theaters limitedly, because we kind of saw where entertainment was going as far as like the filmmaking medium is concerned, and we still see it to this day where we're not looking down on you know, films that don't go to theaters anymore. I think when you have success stories like Roma and The Office getting, I mean, not The Office, The Irishman, sorry. Mm. And The Irishman getting a lot of critical claim and award recognition, things like that, that are, that were 
have been happening for probably about the last five, six years now, it, I thought to myself, this would be something interesting to do as a whole podcast, where the only movies we would cover would be the movies on streaming platforms, because you see it now where... <laughs> Even people who are still making A-list films that are released theatrically and wide release today are still coming over to Netflix or Hulu or Amazon right. and doing movies. So you don't have kind of what you had back in, say, the 90s into the early 2000s where the whole idea of doing a direct video movie was kind of like... It was end a of tacit Korea. acknowledgement that you were done with the movie and it wasn't really going to do much. Right? What? It was a tacit acknowledgement that the movie wasn't going anywhere. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, I, I mean, I, I think that's not completely true. You saw Disney putting out, for example, a lot of direct to video sequels sure. because it was so cheap to get them out. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I mean, that was kind of the thing because you, yeah, to do a direct to video sequel was usually something more economical if you thought to yourself, okay, if we do a sequel to this and put it in theaters, there's a little more guesswork as to whether or not that will be successful. Like I look at the fact that the Fast and Furious franchise managed to avoid becoming a direct to video franchise right? is kind of amazing. <laughs> But now, but yeah, now when you have all of these instances where even movies that were supposed to go to theaters end up going to Netflix, and that happened as early as maybe like 2015, 2016, because I think one of the first movies we covered was a science fiction film called Spectral, and that was supposed to actually go direct, go to theaters and eventually got picked up by Netflix. And there was a lot of people that were thinking to themselves, oh, okay, this movie's obviously going to end up being garbage. And then what you discover, or at least what we discovered, was that this was one of the better science fiction films that had come out that year. And something that for all the people that say, you know, Hollywood's run out of ideas and Hollywood doesn't do anything really original, this was something that was legitimately original and felt very fresh and not as derivative as a lot of other films may be. Very cool. So, Sorry. Sorry. yeah, so you have those opportunities, I think, especially now with the streaming platforms putting more money into producing films and Every now and then you get something that's great and is an absolute gem of a film that you end up talking about the rest of the year. And yeah, sometimes it's still a lot of, you know, dreck that still gets put out. Like, it's not necessarily a situation where, oh, okay, we're now on to the streaming model, so that's where all of the good content is. And it's still... Like, you have to pick and choose. You kind of have to look at things from a certain perspective of, even if this film wasn't all that great, you can still kind of take comfort in the fact that you're watching it at home, you kind of stumbled across it when you had a couple of hours to kill, and it wasn't necessarily a situation where you had to make the active choice to spend gas money to travel right. to a theater and you had to spend whatever their prices are on movie tickets and then if you had to buy concessions because that's one of the things that can limit the movie experience if you feel like okay I've spent upwards of 40 to 50 dollars just for maybe me and one other person to go see a movie right. and then the movie ends up being garbage right yeah, I feel like one of the things that happened is that we hit a tipping point and I can't point to myself to where it is, where we started thinking of the movie theater less as an integral part. Oh, she froze. Yeah, it looks like she froze up on us a little bit. <laughs> it's a little comforting to know that I'm not the only one dealing with internet woes like that. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's tough. It is, it is. Uh, like, sorry, you froze, Julie. Say that again. 
Yeah, the movie, how much did you, of that did you hear? Uh, I heard the movie yeah, like theaters that. is an integral like, part of. Okay, well, I, you know what? And you know, that was God sparing you from some of the purple pros. My point was, <laughs> the, movie theaters, in, the, the movie theaters have become less of a part of the production line and more of just as a middleman that can often be, a packager that can often be cut out. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> It's just, a, it's a lowering of barriers to entry. And with it, I feel like it's not that movies have gotten bad and streaming has gotten good necessarily so much as we started to decouple our ideas of where you're going to find talent. Going straight to video. Sorry, you're muted. We missed the sound on that. No, I think her audio just went out again. Yeah. You there, okay, Chief? I'm just going to sit still and look pretty because I don't think you're hearing much. <laughs> <laughs> no, but what you're saying is definitely something that I agree with. And I think that you would have this point where, yeah, a lot of people are now seeing that as a venue for, like, getting discovered, whether it's actors or filmmakers themselves, because I feel like people like, you know, D. Reese, who did the movie Mudbound, like a lot of people started paying attention to her off of that film. And it wasn't a situation where you have all of the stuff that goes into making a film to be released in theaters and just kind of like seeing not necessarily how much easier but you see it as another venue for for filmmakers and actors to get a better chance of being in the larger filmmaking industry hmm. yeah and i think netflix has made some effort to give those creators voices that they may not have had before and you know, still even to the point where, even if it's not to break new talent, but to give veterans like Martin Scorsese a chance to do films that they've been wanting to do for years and just kind of seeing the level of quality they can bring from film to film is impressive. And sometimes you still have those instances where, okay, they're producing this film for Netflix and it's got these big name actors and it's got these big name uh, filmmakers and screenwriters involved and then you watch the film and you're just thinking to yourself hmm it's not always perfect sure sure but you get that you get that with me with uh, movies that go in theaters as well right? yeah right but i'm saying like to the point where you can watch a certain netflix movie and it looks like something that you would definitely see released in theaters and then you look at other Netflix movies and you're just thinking to yourself, was this made for a basic cable channel? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's just me from talking from a uh, filmmaking and cinematography standpoint. And that's that's where I get a little snobbish. Like, sure, sure. Like our, pre our previous ho uh, co-host, um, she would always rag on me about that because... <laughs> She definitely had more of the, okay, I'm just going at this from a film viewer perspective, sure. whereas sometimes I would let the filmmaker part of me get a little too ahead of, ahead of myself. Yeah. I think it's yeah. complimentary. Yeah. No, definitely. But yeah, it was, it was something, f it was just something interesting to do because it's always tough to figure out what you want to do as far as a podcast and what you think will interest people. Right. And I think one of the things that really helped me to like continue with it was just knowing that there were certain filmmakers that I was actually interacting with who were like listening to the episodes of, you know, talking about the movies that they had done and appreciating it. And I just said to myself, well, shoot, if the filmmakers of the movies we're covering, you know, are liking the podcast, even though it's still not necessarily growing our 
fan base that much. Sure, sure. Um, that's still enough for me to say I think I'm on the right track with what I'm doing, and just to keep it going and even um, bringing on Julie because we've been friends for years and we've always had pretty good conversations with one another that I knew that having her as a co-host would be something that would definitely work. Totally. Thank totally. you. I appreciate that. And yeah, uh, I am also filling in the slot of somebody who doesn't have a lot of formal education in movie making and is just coming at it as a consumer. Which I think there's a lot of value in that. Um, I think it's nice yeah, to have sort no, of the, I, I the juxtaposition of, perspectives right. Makes- Absolutely. So the big question, uh, what movies should people be watching during this quarantine? What are some of your favorite movies that you all have reviewed? Well, I don't, I don't know necessarily if it's a favorite, but I think one of the things that, especially during the, um, Ken K and Cohen tenure, uh, that has just recently started was when we did Wild Things 2. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Some backstory, if I may. <laughs> please, please go ahead. Um, I actually went to the school where Wild Things 1, or rather just Wild Things, was filmed, and it was filmed while I was there. And so... I just have a a very warm, fuzzy, soft spot for the Wild Things franchise. Much like you do that one weird-ass high school boyfriend. (laughs) Yeah, that that is something to consider. But yeah. Yeah, That's just, that's that's the only Wild Things anecdote I actually have. (laughs) Yeah, like, it's a profoundly terrible film, Wild Things 2. It doesn't hold a candle at all to the original. And basically, I think I talked about, when we were talking about Wild Things, we were talking about the fact that it was kind of bringing that skin max level, level to the mainstream. Yeah. Where people, there was like, there was just the, the inherent sleaziness to it that was something that we didn't really see in theatrical films. So to have that in this sort of, you know, erotic thriller type caper, you know, with some noir elements in there, kind of basically Elmore Leonard as like a 15 year old boy. (laughs) Side note, if I may. Have you ever- Hashtag tangent? Hashtag semi-tangent. Yes. Has anyone ever watched an erotic thriller that is actually either erotic or thrilling? Because I have not, and I'm not saying they don't exist. Um, what was the one I recently watched? Oh, shit, what was it? Um, with, um, and I am not nearly the movie buff that either of you are. Um, shit, what was it? Uh, with um, Kathy Bates and... Um, Oh shit, what is it? It was so fabulously like just um oh my god, all of my words have just left my head right now, which is very, very helpful um when I'm trying to like form coherent sentences online. Um shit, let me see if I can look this up. Sorry, keep talking. Kathy yeah. Bates? Are you sure you don't mean Kathleen Turner? I mean Kathleen Turner. Ah. Yes. Ah, so body heat. Yes. Was it? Yeah. No, I, I, I should be more clear. There are thrillers that I would say are sexy. It's just if something's labeling itself in a product. There you thriller, go. That's fair. And, and you know what? If Body Heat labeled itself as that in the advertising stage, I stand corrected. Mm. Let's see. Yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of hard. Like, even when you think of stuff like... um basic instinct there was still sort of a kitschiness to it sort of oh yeah no definitely (laughs) but yeah it's hard it's hard to think of an erotic thriller where yeah where it's either erotic or thrilling (laughs) 
And yeah, they always seem to have body in the title. In, in the title. Yeah. B- body heat. Body double. Uh, Nine. Body of evidence. Ooh, yes, it's almost like they share a similar theme. <laughs> I can't quite put my hands on it. <laughs> I know, right? It's, it's kind of like at the tip of your tongue and you're just kind of <laughs> at a loss for words. <laughs> So I'm just writers. Um, yeah. uh, Bethany, I was, I was wondering, Whoops. There we go. would you like to hear about, I don't know, a recommendation for something people might want to watch? I would love to hear your recommendations. First of all, for anybody, this may not be a want, but I want to uh, direct you at the very least to our podcast. Yes. And spoiler warning, if you watch this documentary, it will be extraordinarily emotionally demanding. Oh, Lord, I already know what you're talking about. Which, it's called Don't Fuck With Cats. It's on Netflix. And it is, it is, I think, one of the best documentaries that you will ever hate watching. I cannot, I mean, it's, it's good and disturbing both to the point where we had warnings on the podcast. It, it starts out as an interesting foray into, shall we say, amateur internet detectives and ends up in a place that, well, as an American, I did not expect, although Kai knew some of the story going in. Uh, yeah, this actual, cause this actually um, centers around someone who is from Canada and a murder that took place in Montreal, where I'm from. So I was like, whoa, this is, this is very close to home because there's obviously a lot that I recognized about it and a lot where I was just saying to myself, Jesus Christ, this, it was a tough watch. And it was something that I, again, didn't, think about where it was headed because I didn't really look up enough of the story beforehand. So by the, like, at the beginning of the first episode, I'm watching it and I'm just thinking to myself, this is really kind of goofy. It almost feels like something that would be parodied on a comedy sketch show. Mm -hmm. And then by the second episode, I'm just sitting there riveted completely watching the whole thing. And this was probably on a weekday night at around 11 o'clock when I started watching it. And I had only planned to watch like one episode a day or something, because it was only like three episodes. And then I ended up watching the whole thing and staying up until 2.30 in the morning because it was just so fascinating. So yeah, that was something that definitely disturbed me to watch. And I was definitely happy that I didn't overlook it because it was still something that was remarkably fascinating at the end of the day. Yeah. And um, one of the reasons also that I bring that up in particular is that unlike, for example, Tiger King, might have to repeat that. Seems like your audio is going out. Uh, yeah. Yeah, give her a minute. No I will. No, no, sorry. Actually, you know what? Let me try something. I'm going to try... Um, don't fuck with cats. Um, it's not sensationalistic. Yes, exactly. It does not glorify its subject matter. Yeah, okay. you'll, you'll notice that there weren't any memes that were created yeah. off of don't fuck with cats. <laughs> <laughs> it, it just kind of disappeared in a way that I, it was unjustly overlooked, hmm. but yeah. for obvious reasons. What were the obvious reasons? That it was just disturbing? or It's, it's not memeable. Oh, it's, yeah, it's yeah. It's not. You can't, yeah, like Kai said, it, it's not memeable. There's no one, I mean, there are people to root for, but the heroes are kind of the order, not kind of, the heroes are not colorful. Got it. Yeah. Like, the heroes, like Tiger King for all intents and purposes, is a cartoon character. Right. There are no cartoons here. No. That makes sense. Um, but, yeah, I think 
for me, it's always funny to come across certain films and just see like, all right, why was this made? Because now you just kind of like fall down like the Amazon hole of like straight to streaming horror movies and other types of films. And you kind of expose yourself to a lot of stuff that you would never think to watch of your own volition. And I think probably around the time that um, my original co-host Whiskey quit, that was when I just kind of wanted to give myself a break as tough as it was because we had maybe about a solid two and maybe about two years and three months where we did not miss a Friday as far as um, as far as putting out a new episode. And there were so many close calls where I said to myself, oh my god, is there going to be a new episode out? What, what am I, I going to do? What am I going to do? And we would always hit that mark and we stuck with that for about two hours. I mean, for about two years. Wow, yeah. So to not have that was a blow, but then at the same time, I had to step back and think to myself, I probably needed to give myself a break anyway, or otherwise I'm going to burn myself out doing this podcast and wondering yeah. how many people are really gravitating towards it, how many people are actually talking to other people about it. Totally. And whether or not I even wanted to continue doing it at all, but I knew I wanted to keep it going, and if I could find someone that would do it with me, then all the better, because I was not prepared to do this up do this as just a single person podcast. Sure, sure. Nice. Uh, so That's what else? Old... Yeah, how is the ogre coming? It's okay, I think, I don't know. I've never made this before. <laughs> um, so my experiment oh. is that I'm gonna try to make it with my sous vide machine that Nasser got me. Um, and which I feel like should be good because the whole thing about yogurt is that you're supposed to keep it at a very low temperature. You're supposed to, you're supposed to boil it and then cool it down and then keep it at like a hundred degrees for like six hours or something, which is very much in the, in the, which is very much what a sous vide machine generally would do, I think. Um, but anyway, we'll see if this is going to work. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. I may just have, you know, some uh, thick milk on my hands or some just milk on my hands, but it should be okay. I think so. I think this has to sit for six hours now, but I could be wrong. I've never made this before. Did I mention that? <laughs> this I mean, is all an experiment. Somewhere. I've also never. Yeah, oh, I should have Googled this to beforehand to figure out if yeah, this is even a thing people do. Never done before. Um, wow. Let's see, do people do sous vide yogurt? Um, so what else should people be, what else do you recommend that people check out? What are some of your other, um, yeah, recommendations? Well, um, we have a lot one of time to kill. my recommendation and not Kai's is I am the pretty thing that lives in the house. Okay. <laughs> that goddamn movie. <laughs> it is, if you like creeping, creeping horror that it, it's just, it's a horror movie. It's very much one of those creeping dread sense of Instagram ready terror movies. And one of the things I like about it, besides it being terrifying and having Ruth Wilson, is that it shows what I think is a strength. Uh, chime in if you can hear me. Yes, yes, we can uh, hear you. I can hear you. Oh, okay, great is that it highlights one of the things that I think is a strength of, uh, like a positive strength of straight, straight to streaming stuff besides it being cheaper to get out there, which is it can cut a lot of the fat off. A lot of movies are best at 90 minutes, but to get something into theaters, you don't see a lot of 90 minute big screen movies. And we've talked about that, Kai, like there's always a lot a lot of fat on a lot of movies that are better with it. No, I definitely agree. I think one of the benefits of the straight to streaming that we see now, as far as these movies are concerned, is that they're not trying to waste a lot of time. 
And I think that as we look at some of the films that come out now in theaters, there's so much that I think people try to like put prestige on now, especially when it comes to the Marvel films, because I feel like you know, there was no reason for Avengers Endgame to be three hours long. Like, I, I really love every minute. But you're right. <laughs> yeah, I love but I mean, but I. <laughs> Having watched, rewatched. I guess um, they didn't make it into two movies. No, I justify them making it into two movies. That makes perfect sense. But I rewatched Infinity War and Endgame back to back, maybe about two weeks ago. And when I was watching Infinity War, I definitely felt the length of that film, and I felt like, okay, this is something that could have probably been at least half an hour shorter than it ended up being. And I feel like that's something that we're doing a little bit too much of, where it feels like maybe a callback to the three-hour studio epics that we used to have back in the 40s and 50s. But I don't think it's necessarily translating to today. And I think... That's one of the things that I do like about um, comic book films that get adapted to streaming platforms now, because I feel like depending on what the comic book is, you can do something in 90 to 100 minutes that's going to stay with you and be a little bit more of an enjoyable experience. Like, I look at movies like Polar with Mads Mikkelsen, that's just a bug that's insane film, but it knows when to end, and it's not trying to be this grand, expansive thing. And I think when you look at certain comic book movies where I feel like now it's kind of the same way comic book publishing is, where the big two, it's Marvel and DC and nothing else. So now you have all of these other independent comics that get made into films that go to streaming and have a life there. And you also see stuff like uh, Lock and Key on Netflix, which was trying to be a series on one of the major broadcast channels and also tried to be a movie as well and and could never come together and now is doing pretty good as a Netflix series now that it's finally gotten made. On the flip side of that, you have stuff like October Faction that unfortunately did not find an audience and was canceled after its first season. So... It's not that streaming makes more opportunities for more successful um, shows and television, uh, shows and movies, but you definitely see more properties that may be getting adapted that probably had a long time coming and tried to either be a television series or a film or both on the major platforms as opposed to doing stuff on Netflix. And I think there was one of the great... This is becoming a major platform in its own right. Yeah. So, I mean, Netflix and Hulu and Amazon, like, they're all kind of doing stuff that's pretty good, and especially as far as their movies, because I think... Amazon kind of approaches it differently than Netflix, where Netflix wants to be able to do any genre as far as movies are concerned, where they gave Michael Bay an insane budget for Six Underground, and that movie was just excessive. <laughs> I, I haven't seen it yet, because I hear such bad things about it, but... Um, it ha- here, here's the thing. I think... When you don't have give Michael Bay some level of oversight, he can be a little too reckless for his own good. <laughs> but you still have some like great staging of action scenes and pretty dynamic a pretty dynamic look to the cinematography and 
something that definitely looks like you can see where his amp is on that film. But then you just think to yourself, good lord, do we have to see every innocent bystander that gets like mowed down by a sports car or every <laughs> villain's goon who gets blown out of the windshield of a car? And... Yeah, we do. I mean, no. <laughs> yeah, so you have that, and I think Amazon is more, their approach to original films is just to do something that's very small in scale, not try to do sort of like anything big in terms of action or science fiction or even horror. Like, I don't think I've seen like a lot of horror films that um, Amazon has produced as original films to be put on their platform. But Hulu has the whole Into the Dark series where that's basically anyone who wants, you know, that's where they're getting people who want to work in horror and may have not had their break. And this is where they're letting them get to do certain films that they might not be able to do through any other venue. Uh, just, and you've been coming, cutting in and out, but Into the Dark, you might want to explain what that is. Um, um, that's basically, um, Hulu's, Hulu just has, like, their own, like, series of horror films that they do. A lot of them are actually based on the different holidays from month to month. So, like, the first run of films that they had was, all right, it's New Year's, so we need to have a uh, New Year's themed movie. For, uh, Valentine's Day, we need to have a Valentine's Day movie. St. Patrick's Day. St. Patrick's Day. Yeah. That so. One. Yes, sir. Which one? Yeah, the one about April Fool's Day. Oh, yeah. I don't think I've gotten around to that. And I know they have a new one for St. Patrick's Day called Crawlers that. Oh, I haven't seen that one. Yes, we should definitely check that out once you uh, uh, acquire your headset. <laughs> Uh, yes, because obviously, yeah, because obviously, um, Julia and I haven't been able to record the last like month or so, just because of the whole. Who, who can say? I don't quarantine. know. That's yeah. the whole thing. Not able to get together. Yeah. But um, uh, this month is usually the month that we do um, Canadian themed um, films. I call it clearly Canadian. And we've done that for, this will be the third year we're doing it now. So I actually got Whiskey Back to appear on the current episodes that we have going throughout the month of April. And that's been fun because there are a lot of Canadian movies that I knew we had to cover and some that I had to like pass on just because there were other ones that I really wanted to do more. And... It's, that's always fun to like reach out to like Canadian filmmakers and get them to sort of help get the word out about those episodes as well. Because I think one year we did Hobo with a Shotgun, which was oh, cool. Hobo with a Shotgun, which I saw in theaters. Yes, <laughs> yes. And I think that same year we also did uh, the two uh, Bad Cop, Bond Cop movies. Okay. Which was hilarious just because the whole thing revolves around a cop from Montreal having to work with a cop from Toronto. So for me being from Montreal and Whiskey being from Toronto, we knew we had to do that. And the fact that, yeah, there was like a whole decade gap in between those films where I did not expect them to do a sequel. But it was it was fun to watch because, yeah, you think of all the different kinds of genres of film that you have where it'd be fun to do you know it, it's fun to acknowledge that there's a buddy cop franchise of movies from Canada and especially being from being from Montreal and like, perfect that's that's great we also covered uh ginger snaps and another wolf cop so um, again we have to I have this Thing where I feel like the best Canadian, the best werewolf movies end up being Canadian. 
Thanks. So there's a request for um, upbeat recommendations to forget about the pandemic. Upbeat recommendations to forget about the pandemic. Um, yes, I was about to say, you're, you're okay with Christmas movies? And why not? Because time doesn't mean anything anymore. You can right. watch Klaus. Klaus is amazing again. That it's one was um, like, updated for um, Best Animated Feature at the Oscars this past year. Really? Huh. It's on Netflix. It's basically it's like a beautifully decorated Christmas tree. Is I think what we compared it to in that it doesn't exactly hold any surprises. It's just a perfect example of its kind. Got it. Nice. Yeah. It's kind of being a delightful, well, Santa-related animated movie. Nice. Yeah, it's that's that's where you're gonna get your feel-good stuff. Because yeah, we we we've usually covered some relatively dark stuff on <laughs> here. Um, another um, animated movie on Netflix worth checking out is um, Next Gen, which is basically like a girl and a robot that she found. So it's kind of Iron giant -y in a way, but definitely feels a little, it's definitely meant to be a lot more high tech. And again, this is just something that's very cute and endearing and not terribly mean spirited. Hmm. Hey guys, sorry, that was my internet um, being an asshole this time.